You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to Garibaldi Red, the Nottingham Forest podcast from Nottinghamshire Live. My name is Matt Davis, hosting as usual, and we're joined for a special episode by a true Reds legend in Ian Soaring Moore. Ian, good evening. How are you? Yeah, good evening, Matt. Yeah, getting through it. Yeah, with all this going along in the country. So uh, keeping safe and well, thank you. Good, good to hear. It is a very terrible time in the world, certainly. Um, uh, you're our first guest from um, the pre-Brian Clough era, that kind of right, threshold. Okay. Um, we've had Gary Burtles on and Frank Clark on, but you're the, the first from the, um, the pre-Brian Clough years. Uh, I should, just to introduce you, I mean, uh, obviously a lot of fans know you, but you're the fifth all-time scorer with 118 goals in 236 games between 1962 and 1972. Is it nice for you that you're still remembered as a, a you know, as a proper Reds legend by the fans, even all yeah, these years after yeah. finishing? Of course, yeah. You know, I think so. You know, I think um, you know, many, many happy years. Uh, to be honest, Matt, with you, know, I had a you know, a lot of wonderful empathy with the fans. So, um, you yeah, know, I had this sort of uh, whether it was luck or good fortune to score quite a number of goals. So, uh, yeah, I mean, very, very happy days there. Um, I mean, probably the best season we had in what was probably what 67, 68, wasn't it? When we got to the semi final of the cup and the uh, finished second in the league that year. So, uh, disappointing not to win anything that season, Matt, but uh, certainly but we had a decent side together. Do you think that team gets the kind of recognition it deserves? Because obviously, in the 70s, the team won the European Cup and the league, yeah. and that's an incredible yeah. achievement. But oh. to finish second, do you think maybe your uh, side or generation is, is a bit overlooked, do you think, or not? Well, I think to be to be fair, I think you know I mean probably overlooked in some respect. But when you when when you have to congratulate that team of the what late seventies, one to early eighties that that won those competitions. I mean it was a it was a wonderful feat. So perhaps we would have probably had more, but people would remember us more if we'd actually won something that season. I think you know uh, could be seconds okay, but you don't get sort of recognised it for it, do you really? But um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can't take away from how well that team did, you know, winning the European Cup, winning the league. So, uh, Cluffy got a, a brilliant side together there. But, yeah, I mean, I suppose in some respect that, um, you know, it was a long time ago, 67, 68. Of course, a lot of the, the younger um, younger element of the Forest supporters well, didn't remember that. Year, never mind being born then. So, I must say that, we, you know, at that team I played, we had, we had some wonderful players, Matt, and... Uh, it's just a shame that it seemed to disintegrate after probably a year or so after that successful season. How did you end up at Forest then? You're not a Nottingham boy. You, you came from Scunthorpe. No. What, what was the process to, to coming to Nottingham? Yeah, well, I was, um, I was actually born in Ipswich, actually, Matt. But uh, my father was the uh, he got the job as the um, chief architect for the Scunthorpe Borough Council not too long uh, after the war, the Second World War had finished. So I spent most of my uh, childhood in Scunthorpe. But as I say, I was actually born in Ipswich, but um, yeah, I think what it was at the time, uh, my father knew somebody that um, used to go around to the to the local matches, youth matches, schoolboy matches. And he was a friend uh, at the time of, he'd been in the RAF actually with a guy called Joe Mallet, who was a coach at Forest at the time. And uh, lovely man, Joe, by the way. And um, he you know, he'd watched me play on numerous occasions in local football, schoolboy football, youth football. He recommended me to, to Joe Mallet. So I went, I remember going over a couple of trials while I was still at school. Um, uh, so consequently, they must have thought a little bit about me. And they, they offered me, um, I think in those days, you just joined the ground stuff. You know, it was quite a menial, menial job, actually. You know, you, in the morning, it was all about cleaning the ground and, uh, you know, looking after the players' boots and putting the kit out, etc., etc. So uh, hard task in those days. But... Um, Eventually, you um, hopefully at 17 in those days, you, you were hopefully going to get a professional contract. Now, if you didn't, you were, you were gone then. They didn't, give a, they didn't give you another year to sort of mature or progress. It was uh, the 17 they gave you a professional contract, Matt, and if they didn't, you'd gone. What, what happened to you? I, obviously, at 17, they, give you, they gave you a yeah. contract. I'm, I'm guessing you weren't on great money. And were you <laughs> commuting from home? Were you living with a teammate? How, how did it work back then? Well, they put us in digs on Hound Road behind the cricket ground. Now, it's, well, not a funny story, but uh, I remember the, the digs were four pound. Um, it was a, it was a, actually it was a guy from Leeds, and quite a number of uh, number of uh, you know the players older than myself were living there. We were in digs there in those days, as you call them, and uh, they were four pound a week. So uh, 
I was. I think my first week's wages was four pound fifty, so I had fifty <laughs> pence. <laughs> yeah, I had fifty pence left for the week, Matt, to uh, look after myself. So I remember knocking on the door. The um, the manager at the time was Andy Beatty, and he was quite a sort of stern, uh, strict Scotsman, actually. You know, a bit 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 like a bit of a headmaster, actually. And uh, I thought, how am I going to manage on fifty pence a week? So I knocked on his door, you know, very quietly, very surreptitiously, and uh, I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say? I said, oh, excuse me, Mr. Beatty. I said, uh, um, I've got, I've only, I'm only on four pound fifty a week. I said, and uh, I've got to pay my digs at four pound. I've only got fifty pence left for the week. In that sort of Scottish brogue, he said, Ian, I will give you another two pound a week. So <laughs> I got another two pound a week out of him, Matt. And uh, you could manage in those days, funny enough, but. Yeah, four pound fifty. I don't think they get out of bed for that now, would they? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're on fifty grand a week now without playing a yeah. game. Some of these lads, yeah, aren't they? Oh, so... Absolutely. Yeah, have <laughs> times changed in terms of wages? <laughs> Certainly have. Um, so, you, when did you make your debut? Were you still? Uh, yeah, I 18? think I was eight, eighteen. It was um, the end. Of, I'd been playing in reserves, and uh, I was really mentored by uh, uh, Jack Burke. And I'm not a lot of the older fans remember Jack Burke. He was the captain of the cup winning team. Uh, mm. Was it was it fifty eight, fifty nine, mm. and you know he was absolutely fantastic with me. I think he saw something in me, Matt. And man, but I will tell you what, he was tough as old boots, Jack. He put me through it. You know, I think I came as about a seven stone weakling, and my word, you know, Jack was tough, and uh, he toughened me up, and he got me quick, and he got me strong, and uh, you know, I cursed at the time, but my word, he, you know, he was a, uh, it was an absolute diamond for me, and uh, he really got me playing, and uh, so. Played in the reserves, you know, doing well in the reserves. And it was the end of the 19, I believe it was a 64 season, I think. Something like that. I can't quite remember the exact the exact date or year. And uh, they gave me the last game of the season. Took me for the last game of the season against Ipswich, funnily enough. <laughs> Ironic, wasn't it? Born there. <laughs> and um, I think we won the game 2-1. Well, I made one of the goals. So that was a start anyhow. And then I didn't actually, I started in the reserves again that following season, didn't play again in the first team until Christmas, actually. Uh, we played Sheffield United at, at home. This I think that was Boxing Day. And, uh, and I remember it vividly, actually, not particularly because that I scored a goal, but we were 3-0 up at half-time. And it, the pitch, I don't think they would have played it today, Matt. It was terrible conditions, really slippery and icy. And uh, anyway, I scored a goal and anyway, it finished up 3-3. They scored three in the second half. But two days later, we went to Bramall Lane and played Sheffield United away, as you did in those, in those years. And um, we won 2-1 and had the good fortune to score both the goals. So uh, three, three games, three goals. So it was, a, it was a reasonable start for me. What kind of club was Forest then? The, I guess the ground looked different. Uh, oh, they, they'd won the cup a few years earlier, so they were a, a yeah. big club. But what, what kind of team was Nottingham Forest in the sixties? I mean, they, they were a first division club. You know, they were they, they were they were sort of well, well known as a first division club. I think they'd been uh, promoted prior to them um, a couple of seasons prior to them winning the 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 um, FA Cup. So yeah, consequently, they were. I suppose, you know, medium to biggish, you know, first division club in those days, which, of course, was the highest league in those days. Uh, set it was, I mean, it's not as nice a ground as it was, it was it is now. But um, I do remember that, um, you know, the big spine cop at the end of the, at the, at the back end of the, the opposite end of the Trent end, it was, uh, I think, they could probably get about 20,000 on there. So, um, you know, it all seemed full the ground. I mean, I think we used to get decent gates in those days. So, um, you know, and, um, you know, they had a lot of experienced players when I first made my grab. People like Jeff Whitefoot, uh, who still remains a friend of mine. And, and uh, just to tell you a little story, I bet people don't know this. He's probably, you know, probably a bit bizarre, actually, and probably shouldn't be said, but he's a, the only person still alive from the 1958 or 59 Cup winning team, Jeff. Hmm. And so I made friends with him, Johnny Quigley, people like that. Uh, Bob McKinney, of course, who are, who, who, who I played with on numerous occasions. Bob played in well into his 30s. I think he might be the record um, appearance uh, for the yeah. main record. Is that, is that correct, Matt? Is it? I think so, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, that was a good team. It, it's, it became a hell of a team, didn't it? With, you know, with Baker and yourself and people oh, like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, a bit, that was a bit earlier on, Matt, to be honest with you. I mean, that, you know, uh, I think when Johnny Carey came and the, and the coach, Johnny, um, Tommy Kavanagh came, 
uh, prior to that 66-67 season, um, we're a bit in the doldrums. And, um, yeah, I mean, to be fair to Johnny Carey, they've got a decent side to get, to, together then. Um, we, we changed the shape from the old formation down to 4-4-2. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we've got a sort of um, a well-balanced side together, really. We had a bit of everything in the team. Um, Peter Grummet was a goalkeeper. I mean, he's... He's probably one of the best shot stoppers I've ever seen. He, some of the some of the games he, he kept us in it with some remarkable saves actually. Uh, big full back, big full backs Peter Hindley and Johnny Winfield and Peter Hindley still remains a really good friend of mine. Still, although he's he's suffering a wee bit at the moment with dementia, it's very sad to see. Uh, Terry Hennessy, who became um, you know a world class central defender, he came up. Terry actually came as a, um, a central midfield player, but he. He wasn't particularly mobile and quick, Terry, but when he went into the back four alongside Bob McKinley, he was absolutely superb and uh, became captain of the sea, great leader, and, uh, you know, he was a big stalwart at the back, in the back four there. Then the four across the, um, the middle of the park was Barry Lyons on the left, myself down the left, sorry, Barry Lyons down the right, sorry, myself down the left, and um, Johnny Barnwell in midfield, who was technically very good, you know, he stitched his side together in the middle of the park and alongside me was Henry Newton, who's an absolutely fantastic player. Henry had so much energy, committed, drive and, you know, box to box player. He could um, put his foot in it, he could, he could score goals. So really Henry was, Henry was a, an integral part of that side. And up front we had Joe Baker and um, Big Frank Wigland, who, you know, they sort of um, played together. I think it's probably the first time that season, but they soon developed into a really potent strike force. I mean, Joe in particular, he was, was a fantastic player, Joe Baker, and uh, Frank alongside him was a big, strong, strong ladder who used to win all the headers. And to be fair to Frank, he made a lot of goals for me, just, you know, just little bits and pieces off him. He used to read the scraps off him. I think one of the reasons why we didn't particularly win anything that season, Matt, was because that uh, in the FA Cup final against Everton Home in the quarter final, which we won 3-2, Joe had a had a horrendous injury. He got um, badly tackled by probably some of the older people remember, but a big centre half called Brian Labone. And uh, unfortunately, Joe was never the same again. It was a really horrific injury. And uh, I think if Joe kept fit, kept uh, fit that season, uh, I'm sure that we would have got on and won something. You're very modestly not saying that you scored a hat trick in that game <laughs> well, uh, no, <laughs> against to be, Everton. To be fair. A lot of people talk about that, me, and I got all the glory uh, that day, uh, Matt. But uh, certainly, I thought Frank Wigan was the star of the show that day. You know, Frank made all the goals for myself, and he was a real handful. Of course, he came for Everton, so I suppose uh, he, he wanted to make a point, Matt. And uh, yeah, I thought Frank was superb that day. Unfortunately, the people that get the goals, you know, score the goals, get the glory. And uh, but certainly, I thought Frank was probably the pick of the bunch that day. Another game that people, another goal people can see from YouTube famously is the one against Arsenal, which um, every fan should see, where you beat virtually their whole team and round <laughs> Bob Wilson and score. Does yeah. that still live in your mind's eye to this day? Can you still well, see those great moments? I, if, if I may suggest, Matt, probably that might be the you know, might be the best goal I've scored for Forest. You know, I've, I've got some decent ones every now and again, but. Uh, you know, a lot of them, a lot of goals you score as a striker. If you could call me a striker, sort of a widey striker. Um, you know, a lot of them are inside the box, but um, you occasionally you have to strike one from the outside of the box. Or, you know, that one I scored against Arsenal. Where um, I think I remember it was, I think it was headed out from our box by Tommy Gamble, who had come down from Celtic actually to join the club. And I think I picked up about I don't know five or so many yards outside our own penalty area. And the thing really that um, I remember most about the goal, uh, Matt, was that Alan Board made his debut that day. And as I picked the ball, if I remember Ball, he running along the side of it. And all I could see were these white boots. I think they were, I mean, were very rare at that time, people wearing coloured boots. And I could just see out the corner of my eyes, I was running with the ball. Borley, you know, trying to chase me. I mean, Borley wasn't the quickest, to be fair, but great player, and, and <laughs> apart from that. but um, And then, because um, Arsenal played in yellow that day, Matt, and... Uh, yellow shirts, and I just sort of, uh, I came to the end, probably about five or ten yards outside there, and I just saw a mass of these yellow shirts, I thought, wow, what do I do now? <laughs> and I don't know how I did it, it seems as if the next thing, I, the next thing I knew, I was in front of Bob Wilson, uh, and the thing that I thought to myself, oh Christ, don't cock it up now, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, fortunately for my good self, uh, and the team of course, uh, 
I managed to put the ball in the net. So I would think that was a yeah, that was that was a happy happy day for me in scoring a goal like that. You were a very dapper fellow, I must say, when you watch it back. Um, a, a handsome chap. What was it like being a footballer in Nottingham in the late sixties with the Beatles yeah, like, and the Stones yeah, and the Who? Yeah. Were, were you a bit? Yeah. Were you guys rock stars as well or not? Oh well, I tell you what, it, it began to feel like that at one time. You know, when we had that good season. Um, uh, we got invited to a lot of functions and, um, you know, the girls were screaming and I remember sitting up at the big co-op on um, Parliament Street in the old days. I don't think it's even there now. We had to go to a function and we could hardly get out of the cars there. You know, the, even young girls were there screaming. So, yeah, we, <laughs> I, don't, it's, I, think, I, think, I think what it was, Matt, that Forrest had such a lean time over the past few years that um, I think the actual, uh, the whole city was delighted that Forrest, you know, on the on the cups of cups of probably winning something, you know, fairly substantial that season. It was, you know, so, as I said to you earlier, it's such a disappointment. We just couldn't take that a little bit further. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think yeah, Christ, I'm a lot older than you, Matt. But in those days, the sort of the sixties, early seventies, nothing was a swinging time. It really was, you know. And uh, apparently, there was four girls to every man, wasn't in those days. So, the term, <laughs> so but uh, yeah, it was, a, it was it was a lovely time to be in Nottingham actually, and. Uh, Certainly, that season we had it was uh, it was remarkable. And as much that I think the whole, you know, including apart from the Forest fans, the whole city I think took took to the uh, took to looking at Nottingham Forest on a more um, successful basis. Hopefully, well, it must have been an exciting time just to be a footballer with the way I guess society was changing a lot from what you know people of my age read about it with you know rock and roll and changing oh, attitudes yeah. to the world it was there an yeah. exciting time just to be playing in general oh it was an exciting time i mean the crowds were good as well i mean the uh you know i remember many many games at the, uh, the city ground there we would get sort of ooh, forty thousand plus on, on numerous occasions um you know certainly if manchester united came or one of the bigger clubs at probably 48 forty nine thousand. i believe that uh, the quarter final of the FA Cup against Everton in that year, Matt, I think, well, they said there was 49,000 there, but I think there was more. It was, um, I think they even let kids come over the wall behind the Trent end, which, of course, they wouldn't allow uh, in this day and age because of the, the safety aspect of it. But, you know, the ground was absolutely, oh, it was absolutely electric, the atmosphere that day. And mm. my, my poor old mother, God rest her soul, she was at the... She was at the game that day with my father and she had to leave the ground because it was just, you know, the atmosphere was so, so electric. And of course, the, you know, how the game progressed and you know, she had to leave the ground. I think she, <laughs> she felt rather faint, actually. But, but yeah, it was a fantastic time to play, Matt. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to play with some very, very good players and uh, they helped me a lot. And without them, I wouldn't have had the success uh, uh, that, I, that I had. What was the manager like, Johnny Carey? Obviously, everyone knows about Brian Clough yeah. and Carey goes under the radar a bit. How good a manager was yeah. he? Jo Johnny was a lovely, lovely man, a really nice man. Never, hardly ever raised his voice, Matt. You know, he was, um, he, the team talks were very short and sweet. He, uh, he said, this is the way we play, you know, um, this is what we want you to do. Uh, you know, but there was never sort of... Uh, you do this, you do that, you know, this is where, what I want you to do. It was just, you know, I think he assembled some decent players, to be fair to John, you know, people, as I say, he brought Joe Baker in, John Barwell in, Frank Wignall in. So, you know, we had a um, sort of abundance of some really decent plays, I thought, and, um, uh, you know, Johnny Carey was instrumental in this, and, of course, Tommy Kavner, he was, uh, it was Tommy was a very, t you know, he was a hard taskmaster as well. I mean, the training was particularly hard, and, uh, you know, we, we never had a, well, I think we had the odd day off, but gen generally the, the training was, you know, it was tough and it was hard, but uh, it got its just rewards in the finish. But um, I think uh, John Johnny Carey was, um, you know, a lovely man to, to, to work for and uh, he brought quite a bit of success to the club. It was just, I, and I don't know why they've done it, it seems to be a Nottingham Forest trait. I, don't, I suppose it happens at other clubs as well. They seem to get decent size together. And the following season or the season later seem to disintegrate, though. I don't think it was too long after the European Cup teams, they started to disintegrate somewhat, didn't they? What was training like back then? I've interviewed uh, more senior players like Gary Bertels and Frank Clark, and they, yeah. they talk about how Brian Clough's training was you know, quite chilled out and it was physical stuff, but not tactical stuff. Was it, was it similar no. for yourself? Oh, absolutely. Very little tactical. We didn't, we didn't really work on set pieces. We didn't know much about the opposition. Uh, 
you know, since I got into the <laughs> the scouting part of football, I mean, it was some managers wanted a, um, uh, oh, I mean, it was a full full length report of the opposition, but you know, talking to the, you know, some you know, like people like Martin O'Neill and Robbo are still good friends. I mean, I think Clubby talked. That, well, I think his mantra was, you know, we're, we've got enough to worry about my team. I'm not worried about the opposition, so to speak. And they didn't want to know about their, you know, their set pieces, uh, how they played, how they set up. And uh, I think that was uh, similar to Johnny Kerr. You know, he thought we had a decent side. Why worry about the opposition? And um, I think, you know, I think it's a lot more thorough now from what I can gather. You know, all these stats that suddenly appear on the TV, how far the players have run. Oh, how many touches in the opposition half? I think it drives me bonkers, to be honest, about all this. I mean, generally you can see whether players played well or not, can't you, without having all these stats, I'm sure about that. So it was more simplistic in those days, a set-up, really, yeah. More simplistic by, by a million miles. How would you have got on if you were in your prime today as kind of a wide forward? That's the, that's kind of an in-vogue thing today, isn't it? On, on better pitches, yeah, would you have got on well? Oh, do you know, I think... Um, when we probably sat, sat at the odd game with Robbo at Forest and we, we know we're both said to one another, you know, just looking at the surface, we thought, you know, just have 10 minutes on there to see what it was like to play in that surface, really, because, I mean, when we played, I mean, by the, phew, let's see, so the first first game was usually August, wasn't it? But you would say by, phew, end of October, definitely, that there wasn't a blade of grass on the pitch, apart from probably down the sides a wee bit. And... Uh, the odd bit in the goal mouth, you know, which hadn't been used a lot. But I mean, some some of the services by Christmas were were not particularly easy to play on Matt. And you know, you had a really good first touch. Not like not like today's where you know it's like a billiard table, isn't it? Really, where the ball comes mm. to you true, and you don't have to worry about your first touch. You know, you could just play the ball first first time if you want to into into one of your colleagues or into space, but. When I played, I mean, you know, sort of, as I said, by probably October, it used to come bobbling to you or it's stick in the mud. So, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an easy time to play football. I mean, um, every team um, had a few, um, uh, I think probably it's a euphemism for, you know, could put it about, you know. Uh, <laughs> I can't say the word, but dirty B&Bs, you know. But, yes. Uh, every team had about four or five in those days, Matt. And um, um, so... Uh, you know, I think you had to sort of a, a certain, a, well, I don't know what you call it, mental courage, psychological courage, but uh, you certainly, certainly people knew that uh, they were about in those days, defenders, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw a video the other day of um, Vinnie Jones absolutely siding down Eric Cantona, and I don't think he even got uh, sent off for it. And I was, suppose, oh. I wonder, you know, did you know the fullback was going to go through you first touch and oh, you just knew oh, that was going to happen? Oh, absolutely. I thought, you know, I mean, you used to, I mean, of course, you used to know who you're playing, you know, and who the fullback was. And, um, you know, you were always sort of taught as a wing, as a wide player in those days, go, go and test the fullback for pace, you know, see what you could beat him for pace. But uh, conversely, I think uh, probably the manager would say, well, you know, make sure Story Moore knows you're about in the first five minutes. So, um, <laughs> I, I remember when I, when I had that episode at uh, Derby, when I ne- nearly signed for the week, and I was listening to, you know, sort of Cluffy's team talk, and it was, <laughs> it was quite amusing, really. Before I think they were playing Wolves that day, and um, if I've got time to relay this story, Matt. And, yeah, yeah, of course. He, <laughs> I thought, he, old Cluffy was laid on the um, treatment table with his socks off, and his, you know, his his sheet, uh, sorry, sleeve shirt rolled up, and uh, giving his team talk, and I think he. He said, uh, Roy, oh, was it Roy McFly? He said, right, Roy, um, Roy, but, uh, what was his name? Oh, Derek Dugan. He said, hey, you've got Dugan today. I want to see him on his arse in the first five minutes. And um, who else was it? Oh, yeah, Roddy Webster was the right fullback. Uh, Ronnie, you've got a lad called David Wagstaff you're playing against today. I want, to, you, I want him to be sat with me in the first five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, things like that, just very simplistic things like Kevin Hector. Kevin, you know your job, get me a goal. And um, but and then he, um, I think, um, uh, oh, funny, the funny thing was, I think the funny thing what they said to Archie Gamble, he said, oh, Archie, you, the, they're putting this lad called, um, oh, Mike Bay, you might remember the name, he was, a, he was quite a tough midfield player, and they're telling me he's going to kick you off the field, um, um, Archie. 
He said, oh, I've got news for you, and I've got news for Wolves, aren't you? You're not playing today. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, you know, I mean, he could be very amusing, Cluffy, couldn't he, really, you know? And uh, listen, I mean, I fell out with him over that. Um, you know, he never really spoke to me again after that episode at Derby, but, you know, I still respect what he did for, for, for Forrest and, and, of course, Derby County. You know, he was a very successful manager, so no hard feelings in that respect. Yes, we'll talk more about that. I just wanted to ask, was there someone in the Forest team who kind of looked after you then? Was there a, a did you have a hard man who would, you know, make yeah, sure that no one took liberties? Yeah, I think two really. Peter Hindley, uh, my poor old pal Peter Hindley, he was, oh God, he was as tough as old boots, Matt, off the field and on it. You know, he could mm. look after himself. Nobody messed with Peter and uh, big Frank, big Frank Wignall. I mean, mm. as I said earlier, I think he, uh, Part of my my success was down to Frankie. He used to win so much stuff in the air and I balls into the box and I just fed off the scraps of him. So I would say that him and um, him and Frank, uh, Peter Hindley and Frank were the, probably the two instigators that sort of bred terror into the opposition. And also Henry Newton, of course. Henry was tough as old boots as well. Henry could look after himself, but you know, at the same time, he was a very good player, as I said earlier. I mean, you touched on your departure there and it's quite the story. <laughs> It, you know, books would be written about it if it happened today. Many of them, I'm yeah, sure. Absolutely, yeah. So, just to tee it up, I suppose Forrest were in financial bother, and then you, they mm. decided they needed to sell you, and you you basically signed for Derby. I mean, I'll let you tell mm. the story yourself. You can tell it better than me. What happened? You were paraded on the pitch and everything. Oh, I, was, I mean, I mean, probably some people probably thought I instigated the the, the thing, Mark, uh, Matt, but uh, I can assure you, I didn't. It, it was a, probably the most embarrassing week I've had in my life, actually. I mean, in retrospect, I can't I can't really understand how Nottingham Forest gave, gave me permission to speak to Brian Club and Derby County because uh, you know, eventually they put the block on it. So there was there's no reason, you know, way. The chairman actually rang my wife on the Sunday night when I presumably signed on the Friday and uh, to say that there's no way he's going to Derby County. So, so on reflection, I'm thinking, well, why did they give permission to talk to, 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 to Derby County, you know? And, <laughs> In a way, Matt, I'm I'm really I'm really pleased that I didn't go there now because of this great empathy I had with the the Nottingham Forest fans, and I think it probably would have been wrong of me to sign for Derby County. Actually, hmm. um, interesting weekend it certainly was. Yeah, I, uh, they uh, took me away to the um, uh, I think it was the Midland Hotel in Derby. I think they called it that by the station where they they stayed every night every, every Friday night before a game at Derby County and. Uh, had dinner with the players and eventually Cluffy turned up. He'd been down to the ground and um, uh, to try and get to Ken Smales, who was a secretary of Nottingham Forest at the time, to sign the, the release forms. I, I'm suppose, I suppose there's another word for that, but I think that's probably what it was generally. And um, he came back to the um, the hotel and uh, he, he said to me, everything's done and dusted, you're a Derby County player. And I said, well, wow, fair enough. And... <laughs> And of course, it transpired over the weekend that uh, they hadn't signed the release forms. Derby County paraded me on the pitch, took me out for dinner that night with somebody else, one of his colleagues, and uh, you know, I just thought, well, you know, I was going to be a Derby County player, but uh, I think it all went pear shaped over the weekend. And the chairman at Nottingham Forest at the time was a guy called Tony Wood. I think he may have had one or two run-ins with Cluffy uh, over the years, and people like. Terry Hennessy had gone to Derby and um, Henry Newton and Frank Wiggle eventually. So I think it, I think they pr probably thought it was wise for the football club that uh, I didn't go there. So I think Tony would rang my wife on the Sunday night and she said, "Turn, listen, time to come home. There's no way he's going to sign for for Derby County." So that's the end of that escapade. You negotiated with Man United. Uh, well, had someone negotiated mm -hmm. for you? I mean, did you? Oh, no, absolutely not. You know, I was so, I mean, when you, you know, I was conducting a, at the time, um, well, yes, it was, I think it was myself, Martin Peters and uh, Alan Ball, we all went for £200,000, which, <laughs> to be honest, I'm a wee bit embarrassed at the price at that time, but I, 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 I'm not particularly, no, I don't, you probably won't get a ball boy for that now, would you, £200,000? <laughs> But no, I mean at the time it was it was I think it was the highest fee myself, Bowley and um, Martin Peters. Yeah, it was, uh, it was it was an extremely interesting weekend, I must admit. And um, I mean I, I, I didn't particularly want to leave the club actually, Matt. You know, I, I, some, I said many many happy years there. But as you quite rightly said, I think they're in financial trouble at the time. I think it was probably I was the last throw of the dice. 
so mm. to speak. And um, so they want, I think they wanted to sell me. And um, uh, so Monday comes and um, who turns up at my house on a Monday evening but Sir Matt Busby and, and, and the manager, Frank O'Farrell in Bingham, where I still live now. Not in the same house, but uh, certainly in the same area. So I think that half the street were out looking at uh, <laughs> Matt, Matt and the big gold, big gold Mercedes. And... Um, yeah, half the street were out on where I lived in those days. And uh, anyhow, they uh, whizzed me back to Manchester, signed for them and um, take it from there, so to speak. It was, um, I mean, it, I, I suppose it was an honour and a privilege from, from my point of view, Matt, to be, uh, to be in the same team, in the same dressing room. People are, you know, three football icons, were British football icons, George Best, Bobby Charlton, uh, Dennis Law, I mean, it's an absolute privilege to be in the same dressing room on the same pitch as them. So, uh, you know, and I, and I started quite well there. I scored three goals in the first three games. And uh, the uh, that was, uh, when did I go? In, uh, oh, that was March, yeah, March 72. So I finished that season off OK. But, um, you know, the club, I think, I think in retrospect, Matt, probably it was the wrong time to join that football club because uh, they were going through um, a rather... Um, how can I say, transitional period, you know, people like Dennis and um, Bobby were coming to the, you know, the great players were coming to the end of their careers and George was, you know, fluctuating uh, one day at the ground, another day not at the ground. Uh, you know, he was messing around a wee bit, George. And uh, so it was a difficult time. And it was a difficult time for Frank O'Farrell, actually. I think it, what needed what needed to happen there was probably what happened with uh, when... Uh, Tommy Doppy took up. I think he had a big clear out, Tommy, you know, all the all the stars of the past and uh, started again. And of course, he got some success from it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I asked you about, you know, rock and roll, being a rock star in Nottingham. What was it like in, in Manchester with George Best living the well, high life at such a huge yeah. star? What was, what was Best like and what was it like yeah. just in general there? Yeah, well, George, I mean, Manchester, like, like Nottingham was a, you know, was a buzzy place. And of course, George was the, George was the king, wasn't he, really? You know, he, uh, he attracted the young ladies, certainly in those days. You know, a good-looking lad, wonderful footballer. And, um, yeah, I mean, I got on well with George. And we, we used to go down to his, um, uh, after um, after playing, uh, sorry, after training in the mornings, we used to go and have a, a bit of lunch at a restaurant near his boutique. And he had this, his barber shop where um, he had his personal barber. That we used to spend a bit of time there. And, um yeah, he was. Um, oh, I mean, he was. Um, he was a massive, massive star, wasn't he, George? And um, yeah, it was. It was. It was an absolute privilege to play with him. It was just a shame how his uh, how his life went as, as it did. You know, it was really sad to see him die at such a young age. What was it like the first time you went back to Nottingham to play in front of the Forest Crans? Because he got almost gone to Derby, Ooh. who I assume were fierce rivals uh, at that Ooh. point as well. Did he get Ooh. a hostile reception or not? Well, I got a hostile reception at Derby. Absolutely, we played. We played that first season. Sorry, the um, I went in March. So you know, that so the following Christmas, we Manchester United. We played Derby on Boxing Day at um, on the baseball on the old baseball ground, and my word, I did get some uh, abuse from the Derby fans, and uh, you know, really, really, it wasn't my fault. But you know, they they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't understand that, and. Uh, yeah, I got roundly booed every time I touched the ball, but uh, I think I had a decent game match and scored a goal, so uh, it didn't turn out too bad, too badly for me actually, Matt. Um, yeah, interesting. But no, when I came back to play for, I think we played uh, Forest. Were I think it was the first might have been about the, oh, might have been about the eighth or ninth game I played for for Man United in '72, and Forest, of course, were desperate to avoid relegation. And, oh, you know, I didn't really want to play the game, Matt, to be honest with you. You know, it was, uh, you know, I'd been at Forest for all those years. Had I say, I had a great empathy with the fans and uh, it, and all, all, all my you know, all my friends were playing in the team. I thought, oh, dear, if I... And I remember Bob McKinley's... I think Bob McKinley was in charge of the side then. Uh, he just said to me before the game, and he said, don't score today. I thought, oh, God, blimey. If I score a goal, what am I going to do? I can't really... You know, I've got to miss a goal for Man United, but... It felt so surreal playing playing that game. I, I mean, I didn't play it particularly well that game. I just I just didn't feel right, to be honest with you, Matt. I just it just didn't feel right for me to playing against my old teammates and 
and the team struggling against relegation. So it just didn't feel right at all. I think Brian Clough seemed to hold it against you as well for a long time. Is that fair to say? And did no, you did. mend those fences or not? Uh, not particularly, no. I mean, uh, he, uh, I, you know, I went past him on numerous occasions, probably as close as, um, you know, five, ten yards away, he completely ignored me. Uh, Peter Taylor wasn't so bad, you know, Peter was all right about it, but no, he, he wasn't very happy about it. And um, I think if Brian didn't get his own way, of course, you know, he, uh, he would never forget it, would he? So uh, I think um, very, very much later on, <laughs> I don't know, my, uh, um, we were all in the, I think Brian was speaking at the, um, at the football ground, actually, and um, in the um, Robin Hood suite, that's right. And uh, uh, we were in the, um, I think it was part of the director's room before the game, people like um, Alan Hill were there, Liam O'Kane, a few of the old players, and uh, Ian Bowyer, I believe. And I was sat talking to a group of players on one side, and I called Cluffy walks in. And uh, I, I initially, initially had his back to me, he was talking to some of the old players at the end, and he suddenly turned around and saw me. Oh, he says, it's you, is it? He said, they tell me you're not such a big a shithouse as you used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, thank you very much, man, for those kind words. Yeah. So that broke the ice a little bit. And I saw him in the old paper, you know, in his pe- on, the, on his son's paper shop on the Central Avenue once or twice after that. And he was, he was OK. But, um, yeah, I don't think he ever forgot to, that I didn't sign for him. <laughs> Do you wish you'd played for him? I mean, Frank Clark was 35 yeah. in the European Cup win. You were yeah. similar age. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I wish I'd had the opportunity to play for any and his team. You know, I mean, to be fair, when I, you know, was, uh, nearly went to Derby, they had, they had some wonderful players there, didn't they? At the time, you know, Todd and uh, uh, Todd, Toddy and Kevin. Uh, sorry, not yeah, Kevin Hector as well. But I'm trying to think of sorry, Roy McFarlane. I mean, they were as good as central central defensive partnership you've ever seen. Todd and McFarlane, brilliant players. Uh, you know, as I just mentioned, Kevin had up front, who was a prolific goal scorer. John O'Hare, who eventually came to Forest, who was still a good friend of mine. John was probably one of the best players with his back to goal you could have ever see. He was he was wonderful at keeping possession of the ball for the for the team high up the pitch. And um, you know, Alan Hinton, of course, I had to go from Alan at, uh, at Forest. And uh, but Alan, to be fair to him, he went to Derby. He had a, he had a great time there. And uh, Alan was probably one of the best crosses of the ball I've ever seen, actually. Two, two great feet, and uh, it was just um, unfortunate it didn't work out for him at Nottingham Forest. Um, but um, no, it was, it, was, um, it was wonderful times to, to be a footballer in those days, Matt. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, um, I don't probably regret, regret anything I did, really, other than um, possibly like to would have seen Nottingham Forest stay up that season. No, it was very sad to leave them that, at that particular time and get them rele- relegated that season. Hmm. People tell me later that um, I think the last game of the season, you, you'll probably correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Matt, I think they played Ipswich, Ipswich Town. I think it was the same day I was making, making my debut for, for Nottingham Forest and apparently the uh, announcer at the ground uh, let the crowd know that he said just to let you know that Ian Story Moore scored on his debut for, for, for Manchester United and I think they lost the game 3 1 and got relegated. I mean, and no, no. rumour has it that they sat the guy that made the announcements. So <laughs> unfair, I thought, yeah, yeah, probably wasn't the, probably the, <laughs> the best thing to say, was it? <laughs> From um, from reading up on you, you had a hell of a career, but do you feel like a bit of a nearly man? Because and don't take oh, this the wrong way. No, you're right, Matt. I'm absolutely right. I say this to my wife, and she's, "Oh, don't be silly, you know." And uh, yeah, I mean, I just seem to sort of get on the fringe of things. Uh, and I got a bad injury, and you know that that season, 1970. That that's right. Yeah, I was, you know, I was playing well and scoring a lot of goals. Then I got picked for the England team, and. Uh, we played against Holland on the Wednesday night, and I think it was about, um, phew, it might have been two or three games, I can't remember the actual time timeline. We played Manchester City away, and um, I suffered a really bad injury. Um, I fell call off the man who was left back for Man City at the time. Um, I don't know, I can remember it to this day, actually. It was sort of one of those wet, miserable, horrible January days up at the old main road ground, the old Manchester City ground. And um, I, 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 mean, I, was, I was through on goal and I shot at goal. And I can remember just really sort of admiring the shot. I wasn't the best one. And uh, 
Uh, I could see this, I don't know who it was at the time, this Man City's coming and he slid from about 10 yards. And unfortunately, my, my, standing, my standing foot, my right foot, was firmly on the ground and he just hit me. And uh, unfortunately, it severed all the ligaments and that ankle. It was a really nasty injury and it was, it was rather painful to say the least. So, yeah, just got in the England team. Yeah, whether I got another cup, I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I, I know I was in the, in, in the squad to go out to Mexico that season, the, the 1970 World Cup. So hopefully I might have got a game. I say it's totally hypothetical. And um, I say just many, quite a number of times and I sort of, you know, got on the um, cusp of one or two interesting things in my career. I seemed to get a bad injury. So, yeah, I think you're quite right in say I was a Navy man. And uh, very unfortunate that um, I had to finish playing at Manchester United through a bad injury when I was, uh, what, 28 years of age. So, you know, I always sort of wanted to, and I think, as you say, I scored 118 goals for, for Forest and I think another 12 or so for, for Manchester United. So, you know, I was always sort of thought, can I get 200 goals in my career? Well, I would have had probably another five years, actually, to, to have a go at that, uh, Matt. And uh, that was a great disappointment for me. Um, from an individual point of view, but uh, you know, hopefully, I would have got another probably five or six years at, at the top level, as you said. I think you mentioned Frank Clark. I think did he come when he was thirty-five? Did you say to Forrest? Uh, we finished when he was thirty-six, I think. Yeah, thirty-six. Yeah, mm. well, Frank had a you know a good couple of seasons there, didn't he? So um, mm. yeah, it, w- it would have been nice to sort of uh, certainly play play uh, a lengthy time in my career. You know, twenty-eight years. Twenty-eight years. You're supposed to be. You know, at the prime of your career, really. Then, so uh, very disappointing. And I think you're quite right. You said that uh, you know things could have worked out for me better. Let's put it like this way, Matt. What do you think as a 28 year old? I don't know if you were told your career was over straight away, or if you were married and had kids. But you know, mm-hmm. the, 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 there wasn't the riches there was today. So, what oh. do you think at that point? Do you think, what the hell am I going to do in my life now, or not? Well, I, I, no, exactly right. You took the words out of my mouth. Uh, my, when they said I would have to finish playing football, you think, God, what am I going to do now? I mean, you know, I had uh, very few opportunities. Although, to be fair to um, to be fair to Tommy Doherty, he um, he, um, he rang the um, he rang the um, who, who was it? Uh, oh, so Walter Wilterbot, who's head of the FA, and they got me on a couple of coaching courses. To be fair to Tommy Doherty, and uh, so I did quite a bit of you know coaching, did my badges, and so I thought, well, I might. Uh, might try and um, you know get into that full time, but um, of course you know there's no guarantee they want to get a job in football. So initially you think, what can you do? But um, so, so I sort of fell into becoming a bookmaker. Actually, I mean it wasn't something I planned to do. Uh, you know, twenty years, twenty eight years old, I had, had to get you know had to get a living somehow. Certainly, did, but certainly we weren't paid enough over the last 10 years as a footballer to have enough to retire like we can do these days. There was this little betting shop in Bingham I used to go in there because I do quite like the horse racing. And um, he was getting fed up with this old guy and he said, well, you know, he was asking me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I don't really know, to be honest with you. And he said, do you want to buy this betting shop? I said, well, yeah, I'll have a go. So... Um, yeah, consequently, it didn't turn out too badly, actually. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I made a fortune, but it was a living. And it was something, you know, it made me go to work every day and uh, do something, which was important. As I say, I was only 28, 29 years of age, eight, eight, eight years of age so I had to do something, Matt, and uh, I, I got into that. And uh, I think I would have certainly um, gone into football earlier than I did do eventually, you know, back into football, should I say. But my wife, got she got... Um, diabetes and she was sort of used to help me running a betting shop when I was involved in football so I had to sort of uh, spend most of the time in a betting shop and to the later day yeah were you pretty angry at how it ended for you I mean uh, as I a 28 year old in your really. prime no I was angry really in some respect that the treatment I got at Manchester I wasn't particularly good um you know these days to be fair to them there were there were scans about scans about in those days Matt and um I mean, they tried everything. I mean, when when I first did first did it at Manchester United, it was in the gym, and you know my my ankle came up like a, a balloon. It was black, and uh, they X-rayed it, and of course there was nothing broken. They couldn't find anything broken on the X-ray, which uh, of course on a, on an on an X-ray uh, it doesn't show if you've got any ligament damage. And as I said too early, there wasn't a, there were no scans in these days. So consequently, they thought when the swelling went down. Uh, you know, I'd be okay, it would be fine. 
So, of course, the swelling did eventually go down after, you know, sort of a few weeks. And uh, I started to be able to run gently and that. And they thought, oh, man, absolutely fine, yeah. What they didn't know, what I didn't know, was that the, the, the main ligament in the ankle was actually severed. And so I could actually run in a straight line. But as soon as I stopped quickly or deviated from a straight line, I just used to pull up and get in pain. And, of course, they didn't know what it was. And it wasn't until... That was early January when I did that in the gym at Old Trafford, January 73. As I said, they probably thought because the swelling had gone down, etc., etc., I was going to be okay. So I was trying to train. It kept breaking down, etc. And it wasn't until May where Man United were playing, playing in London, the last game of the season at Chelsea. The physio said, we've got to your point with a, um, a specialist on, in, in London. And um, so I went on the Friday, we went down on the Friday, had an appointment on the Friday afternoon. And straight away, he said that you need an operation. You know, he said, you, you, you've got a bad ankle. He, he, he picked it up straight away. So I've been trying to train and play football from probably late January of that season until, you know, the end to sort of beginning of um, April, May and kept breaking down. And in the interim, if they'd have sent me to London straight away, uh, you know, when I'd done it, they could have operated straight away and probably be able to stitch the ligament together. It came to pass that when they eventually the surgeon in Manchester did operate on me in, um, uh, I think it was late May, uh, after the operation, he came to me and said, uh, he said, I've done the best I can, he said, but uh, your ligament's very frayed. He said, I, won't, I wasn't able to stitch it together. So very disappointing news. I did try uh, to try to get going the, at the start of the following season, but uh, it wasn't quite right, Matt, and uh, I'd lost that, you know, which was part of my game, that, that sort of turn of foot, which, uh, you, which you need to go past defenders, and it just wasn't, you know, I was probably, I don't know, probably got to about 75% fit, but uh, you know, it was you know, I didn't feel right, and of course the club at Man United didn't feel right, so consequently came to an agreement that I should retire. Did you get paid off? They didn't just kick you out, did you? They gave you some money. Oh, no, 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 no. To be, to be fair, they gave me uh, some compensation. Um, to be fair to them, no. Oh, no, they looked after me in that respect, uh, Mark, uh, Matt, sorry. So, you know, it gave me some uh, some funds to be able to sort of, uh, uh, you know, get you know, get somewhere to live, of course, and, uh, uh, you know, see me along the way for a certain period of time. But it's not that it wasn't enough to, to retire and far from it. Mm. How did you, you... You came back to Forest as a scout eventually. Was that for... Was it Paul Hart? I mean, it, well, how did yeah, that Paul, happen? I worked, with, I worked with Paul. Yeah, I mean, Paul, Paul, you know, Paul, to be fair, I think was very unfortunate the way things turned out for him there, uh, to be honest with you, Matt. I mean, um, uh, Paul is one of the best coaches I've ever seen actually work on a football pitch. He's a, he's a really top class coach, Paul, you know. And um, he got the manager job after that, you know, the balacle of um, David Platt being there. And, um, uh, I work with Paul and, uh, you know, we've got a, got a decent side together. I mean, Paul introduced a lot of those young players like of Janice, uh, Gareth Williams, uh, Michael Dawson, Andy Reid, etc., etc. And they played some wonderful football that first season. And what disappointed the, the two of us at the end of that season, you know, we both said to the chairman, I think it was Nigel Dowd, well, it was Nigel Dowd at the time and the chief executive, Mark Arthur, that um, we thought that uh, it would be incumbent at them to keep the squad they've got now and um, enhance it with probably two or three decent players, which we thought, yeah, absolutely fantastic. And we think we could probably be there or thereabouts next season. Well, for some obscure reason, I think it was about two weeks before the season started, Mark Arthur came in, I think it was into my room and Paul was there and more suggested we had to get to sell the better players and uh, only free transfers would be available. So that, that was, um, that was a big hit for Paul, especially. And, um, I think it cost him his job, actually, because, uh, you know, people like Michael Dawson went, Jermaine Jenis went. You know, we were left with, um, well, to be fair, plethora of mediocrity, actually, to be honest with you. And uh, consequently, I think it cost Paul his job. Um, you know, we, we didn't, it didn't do particularly well that season. And uh, I think he brought in, uh, who was the next manager after Paul? I can't, was it Gary Megson, was it? Uh, it? Kinnear. Oh. Kinnear was before oh, then. Kinnear, oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so I, you I, work I, I work, yeah, yeah, for a while, yeah, but <laughs> enough said, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, the other, the other good manager I worked for was uh, Dave Bass. I mean, Dave was great to work for. You know, Dave was a Dave was a great guy, and uh, once again, he you know he got them promoted, didn't he? And um, 
once again at the end of that season, um, you know, it, strange things happened again. He, you know, got them into the Premiership from the, the chat. I mean, it was a terrific season they had. You know, they finished top of that to the Championship, which was a really good league in those days. You know, likes in Middlesbrough, in there, Ipswich Town, Charlton, Sunderland. It was a really tough league, and uh, they had uh, we had two. Um, Strikers up front, you know, the Forest, probably the older Forest uh, supporters will remember this Van Hoy Donk and uh, Kevin Campbell. I think they must have got about 60 goals between them that season. They were, they were really prolific. And, um, well, we thought next season that, you know, keep those two and uh, add, a, add a one, two more to the squad. And, uh, you know, we should be there, you know, we should at least hold our own in the Premiership, should I say, for some obscure reason. I, I don't know why. Uh, they sold Kevin Campbell to a Turkish club. I mean, so that was just before the season started. So, and then of course Van Hoy don't played up about it. So we started the season with with, with two strike. Sorry, two st without two strikes, who got over sixty goals of you know, the previous season. So poor old Dave, he suffered that season as like, as like Paul Hart did. That team's disintegrated, and consequently they got relegated. And mm. it cost Dave his job. You went to work for Martin O'Neill Aston Villa as a scout. You I did, yeah. Are you retired now? Are you still in the game oh, at all? No. Oh, no, no, no. I'm retired now. I, uh, I finished when Martin um, finished at Aston Villa. He'd, um, Martin was very successful there. You know, I mean, he, he had three top six finish, um, uh, top six finishes in three years on a trot, I think. But it didn't seem to be enough for the for supporters in the hierarchy there. It wasn't enough. And I think probably, you know, the problem is, I think, you know, with premiership teams in particular, you know, they... Uh, I don't know, they want instant success, don't they, really? Now, you know, you would think that, a, I mean, they're a biggest club, Aston Villa, but, then, you know, they're not a they're not a Man City or they're not a Manchester United. And to, and to finish in that top six was, I think, was an achievement for Martin. And um, we we tried at the end of the, I think it was the last season when he when he decided to leave to to sign a, a couple of players. One was Den Bailey that went to uh, Tottenham and Scott Parker, funnily enough, who was the Fulham manager now. And uh, the... Um, the owner at the time, Randy Lerner, put the block on it, and uh, I think that Martin saw the writing on the wall and um, resigned. And uh, we all left with him. You know, John Robertson, um, a good friend, John, and um, he was assistant manager myself, and uh, Seamus McDonough, who was the goalkeeping coach. We all we all left with Martin. Yeah. These days, can your kids and well, your kids can probably believe, but your grandkids, when you regale them with yeah. his stories of what he did, can they believe that their granddad did all this stuff or not? <laughs> well. I suppose so, you know, it's, um, it's it's nice to look back, isn't it, really, Matt? But, you know, they say you should never look back in life, don't they, really? But, you know, it's nice to have uh, happy memories. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, as a kid, I always wanted to be a footballer, I mean. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I had, had parents, especially my father, who was football mad. He was a he was a Sunderland supporter, you know, because he was, he was from that part of the world. And I remember him taking me to, to watch the... The, the Sunderland team in the um, late 50s, uh, you know, when I was probably, what, I don't know, 13, 14, whatever it was in those days. And, uh, you know, so excited to go and watch those games. So, you know, that gave me even more, uh, uh, you know, massive crowds in those days. Oh, it must be wonderful to play, be a footballer and play in front of all these crowds. And, you know, fortunate to have the opportunity to do that. So, wonderful, happy memories, Matt. And, uh, as I say, just uh, a little bit discordant because of the, the bad luck I had with injuries when I thought I was just going to take that next step forward. I guess this last day, though, as a 15-year-old kid in Scunthorpe, you'd have taken this life, wouldn't sure. you? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I've met some wonderful people, you know, I've made some great friends in football, you know, people like, you know, as we said earlier, Martin O'Neill, Dave Bassett, David Pleat, who's a big friend of mine. I mean, when I was at the, when I first came to the football club, David David Pleat was, um, if you'd have said to me, let me put it this way, Matt, if you'd have said to me when I first came to Forest at, what, 16, 17, going on to the next year, 18 years, if you'd have said to me he was going to be a, the star at Nottingham Forest, I would have said David Pleat. He had so much natural ability, you know, left foot, right foot, England schoolboys he played for, England youth. He was, had so much talent and um, he just seemed to sort of... Uh, disappear from the game rather quickly in terms of, you know, get, getting playing at a decent level. Um, I think from Nottingham Forest, I'm not quite sure where he went, but uh, I know he eventually went to Nuneaton as a manager. I think that was his first managerial job and uh, he went and had some, you know, quite a lot of successes as a football manager. So I still spoke to, 
still speak to people like David Pleat now, Martin, Robbo, you know, John O'Hare, Dave Bassett. So, you know, I've got a lot of good friends in football over the years and, uh, and they all bring, they've all happy memories and uh, it's nice to talk, you know, enjoy tonight, Matt, with you and uh, sort of uh, hope that... Uh, some of the Forest fans have interest in what I've had to say. Well, it's been a great pleasure to have you on. Uh, like you say, I'm glad you enjoyed it and we're really pleased that you were able to reminisce for so long. Um, and thanks for yeah. giving us so much, almost an hour of your time. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, we'll be welcome, return next week with a more normal episode looking back on the weekend game. And then uh, we've got a couple of other former players lined up. So hopefully people enjoy that. Do stay safe, everyone. And we will speak to you. Thank you for listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening.